Hey there, is today your first time here? Or maybe your first time in a while? If so, maybe you're wondering exactly who we are and what this church is all about. Well, we'd like you to know that we're a group of ordinary people who are on an amazing journey together, following Christ. Our guide is the Bible because it's the divinely inspired Word of God and it will never take us in the wrong direction. Along the way, we hope you'll see that we are welcoming and spiritually passionate and that getting to know you is a big deal to us. We know that the road is rough sometimes, but we'll work really hard to bring you practical and relevant messages to equip and encourage you through life's ups and downs. We want you to know that we care about this community and we believe that it's our job to make it a better place. So no matter who you are or where you've been, we're glad you're here with us today. And we hope that you'll join us on our journey, following Christ and living out His plan for us. So welcome to church.
Good morning. Great to be here this morning as always. Great to have this opportunity to worship God. Thank you so much singers for doing a phenomenal job. Thank you EJ and Jacqueline and everyone that's been involved with the service. We love you guys. We appreciate you guys. And more than anything, we appreciate this opportunity to worship the Lord God Jehovah. Amen and amen. At this time, let's bow our heads and pray as we continue to worship. Amen. Heavenly Father, God, thank you so much for loving us the way that you do. Thank you for your spirit and your power and your grace and just allowing us to bask in your presence and know that we, can, that we live out your, your love and your grace every day. And I pray that the words said this morning for the message are your words, that your spirit moves through me and gets my flesh out the way so that we can hear the very word of God. And I pray you open wide our hearts to receive it. Father, we pray all this in your name and through your Son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen and amen. Well, good morning again. Uh, if you've been uh, with us worshiping the last few weeks, you know that we've had a series going on about the main thing, the main thing. And that series has come out of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And, you know, it, it, the whole idea is the main thing's got to be the main thing. The people search for purpose. They search for meaning. But the Bible tells us that the main thing, the purpose, the reason why we're here is to go to heaven. We're here. He created us that we would one day find him and respond to his love to be with him forever. And then once we're saved... In many ways, we've achieved that purpose, right? Because you can't get more saved. But he leaves us on earth even after we're saved in order to help other people discover the main thing. And so while we're here, we've got to keep in focus while we're living, and we've got to help as many as possible discover that great truth as well. And so we've been talking about the last, that, the last few weeks, what that is, and, and what we can glean out of the scriptures themselves about what that is and how we can maintain that focus. Because here's the thing, we live here. We live in this world with all the challenges and all the pressures and all the anxiety, right? And to keep God in focus in the midst of that, that's no easy thing. That's not easy at all, right? And so we need all the help we can to keep heaven and a heaven-based lifestyle in our focus. And so 2 Corinthians has a lot of tips, a lot of ideas about how we can best do that. And so we've got part four of that series coming up right now. And so it's the main thing, but the subtitle for this lesson is no longer. No longer. And what's that all about? Well, I'm glad you asked. We're going to pick up right 2 Corinthians chapter 5 at verse 16. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 16. And it says, So for now all we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come. The old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Okay, so this is the passage for today. And the, the, the subtitle of the main thing for this week is no longer. No longer what? Well, let's go back to verse 16. It says, for now all we, we no longer see from a worldly point of view that we once regarded Christ in this way. We, we do so no longer. That we're free of, of seeing things the way the world does. That God has set us free from a worldly perspective. And so we no longer see things from a worldly point of view. Now what's that mean? What's that all about? I'm glad you asked. Because here's the thing. You know, we, we grew up being taught to view things in a certain way. You know, the, the view things from a certain perspective, right? The, the world trains us from birth and, and gives us ideas from birth that, that we're not born with. And that's so much of what shapes us isn't what God intended for us, but it shapes our, our worldview, our perspective about everything. You know, I grew up, I was born, I, I came out, right? And I always, always say, man, I came out a full-grown man from birth. My mom said, that's a man, right? No, I came out as a little baby. And I always 
always tell the joke that I've been black most of my life. And what's that mean? Well, all it means is that none of us come out the womb knowing anything about black or white. We just, we just are, right? And we're little kids, we're playing with other kids, but we don't understand black or white. We don't see it. Even when we get a little older and we hear the term, we don't know what it means. But particularly if you're African-American, at some point in life, early on in life, you figure out it means something. And you figure out it changes the way people perceive you. It changes the way people treat you. <laughs> it changes the way you have to act in this world. I mean, it's, you know, you, you, you can't really be colorblind as a black person in America because your color affects everything that you do. That's just the reality of it. Now, maybe America's discovering that for the first time, the bigger America. But if you grew up African-American or black or a person of color in America, you know that, you know that your whole life. But not, not your whole life. But at some point... You learn the lesson. You know, one of the first lessons I learned from my mom about going through the store, I was small, was keep your hands out of your pocket. And you're like, why? I mean, don't, don't ever put your hands in your pocket. He said, because you're a black boy. And that's what they see. If they see you put your hands in your pocket, they're going to assume that you stole something. Very early age, I realized, okay, this means something. This means something. Whether I want it to or not, whether I want to be perceived that way or not, it means something. And it's not all good. Now, God made me that way. It's all good. But in terms of the way the bigger society sees it. Man, the first time I got a little bit older, I'm walking down the street and, and, and someone crosses the other side to avoid me thinking I'm a threat. All five, seven of me, right? I realized that this means something, right? That the color of my skin, this black thing. And so you understand that you're perceived in the world from a certain point of view, and you start to perceive yourself that way, for good or bad. And race is one of the ways that, that we're affected. You know, we, uh, curses are that way. You know, race is, is largely a way that society perceives you. It's not a choice. It's a label that God gives you. I mean, that, that the world gives you. I'm sorry. But curses are that way. Some of the family curses are passed down. You know, it's, it's, it's your, your dad was a certain way. or You know, maybe he's an alcoholic. Maybe he's a hothead. Maybe your uncle's that way. And, and you inherit that curse. And it's not always about genetics. A lot of times it's about what you're told and what you see and what you're told you're going to be. Someone tells you you're never going to be anything. Or tells you you're never going to amount to something. Or tells you that you can't trust men, you can't do whatever. And it becomes internalized and it becomes a family curse. And just because your mama couldn't trust somebody, you can't trust anybody either. And even when you find somebody good sometimes, you still find it hard to trust. And just because your dad didn't respect women, you find that as much as you may have hated that when it came to your mom, that you're living out the same curse. And so sometimes what you're told not only can affect your view of other people, but the biggest thing you lose is it changes your view of yourself. Getting beat down sometimes, it's the worst part of it is not that you're getting beat down in life or you're being talked down or talked about. It's that you believe it. That you believe it. You internalize it. And I'll tell you what. Those are the biggest chains that you can have in life. When you believe you can't be anything, you're never going to be anything. I, I remember leading a ministry in the South Bronx as a young man. And, and you're, you're with people. And, and the truth is the Bronx is, is, is it a, 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 a uniform place. They're, they're, they're good neighbors in the Bronx. But there are beautiful things in the Bronx. And a lot of times the difference between being in, a, in, in hell, really, as far as the hood, the neighborhood, and what's going on, and being in a great neighborhood is only about 10, 15 blocks. Many times less. But you talk to people that have lived their whole life in New York in the same neighborhood, that have never seen anything else but the 15 blocks they live in. They've never been to the other side. Forget about Manhattan, other side of the Bronx, just 15 blocks away. 
and seen houses and, and better neighborhoods, never been across the other side and, and been to Kingsbridge or Riverdale or whatever, and you live in this little, little box because it's all you think you can be and all you think you can have because someone told you that's who you were and you believed it. Someone told you that you weren't good enough or smart enough and you believed it. And it becomes a curse that you inherit because you see yourself in a way that people tell you to see yourself from a worldly point of view, but not God's point of view. God made you the height and the size and the appearance he gave you is a blessing. It's not a curse. God made you smart enough and strong enough and you are wonderfully made. And you are, you are made perfectly. And you are pretty enough and smart enough and able enough. But the world steals that from us. And we see other people and ourselves from a worldly point of view. And we're robbed of our inheritance from God. It's stolen. The world right now is torn apart. I mean, COVID-19 is a, is a terrible thing. We're going through it. The pandemic is affecting all of us in so many ways. All of us feel pressure. And there's job pressure, and there's health pressure, and there's the unknown, and all the different things that we're getting over the, the TV in terms of, of, of information and what do you trust, right? And, and first responders have had to be at risk the whole time. And people had to go back to work and not knowing that they're safe. And there's so many challenges. And in the middle of that, Ahmaud Arbery dies. And Breonna Taylor dies. And, and, and George Floyd dies. And, uh, and Jacob Blake dies. And all these different things. And these things have gone on for hundreds of years. But now it's all on someone's phone. Not all of it, but a lot of it is. And we're home more. And we're watching TV more. And man, it's painful to see. It's painful to witness. And it is tearing our country apart because you've got people crying and fighting for social justice as well they should. And other people making everything the issue but. And everything right now is politicized. Everything is red and blue. It's not, it's not right or wrong. Right? Everybody's siding with the party and siding with their perspective as opposed to just looking at things the way they are. Look, there's either a virus or there's not. Why is it that one party claims it's not there, another party says it is? Why is everything politicized? Man, shooting an unarmed man in the back seven times is either right or wrong. How does that become politicized? That's the world's point of view. The world's torn apart. And sometimes even as Christians, we get sucked into that. And we get sucked in being more American than we are a disciple, more Republican than we are a disciple, more Democrat than we are a disciple. Rather than seeing things in the clear cut way that the word shows it, or the Holy Spirit will reveal it, or, and the empathy and the love and the grace that it brings, the world complicates it. And we become warring tribes. We see things from a worldly point of view rather than a heavenly perspective. I think heaven sees the murder of George Floyd in a very simple way. I think heaven sees the oppressed suffering in a very simple way. It's not complicated. I, I think heaven sees the victims of the pandemic in a very simple way. It's our worldly point of view that complicates it, not the spirit. And the worst thing our worldly point of view does, it changes God. It changes who God is. It's God is small. When I was growing up and I had a worldly perspective, God was important, but he was smaller than my ambitions and smaller than my challenges and smaller than what I wanted. He needed to be a, a part of my life somewhere in the corner, but not my life, right? And then a lot of times, too, God is, you know, God is the great grandfather in the sky, or God is harsh, 
A God is brutal. A God is unforgiving. Because we shape God in the image of people around us. And we, we, we can't understand God's love because we see God from a worldly point of view, either diminishing him or making him something that he's not. The word of God, the spirit of God, the transformation that comes when we receive God's spirit, when we are sanctified and redeemed through the blood of Christ, it lifts the shades off our eyes. I was going to be a prop and whistle sunglasses for a moment. But if I had my sunglasses on right now, it wouldn't change anything that I see in this room. But it would change how I see it. It colors it, right? And the world colors how we see everything, ourselves, other people, situations, whatever. And what the Holy Spirit will do if we let it is take the shades off so we can see it the way God sees it. We can experience it the way God experiences it. And the more and more we can see God, not from the, the eyes of the world or the eyes of our youth or the eyes of our own understanding, but see him for who he is. And when we do, we'll bow down and praise him. We'll bow down and worship him. And we will understand he loves us so much. And we will be bathed and washed every day in unimaginable love and grace. That's the heaven road right there. That leads to a heaven path right there. But we've got to shrug off the worldly point of view. And get back to the godly point of view. It doesn't mean you don't see problems. Look, with or without sunglasses, I see the same things, the same issues, but they're colored differently. And we've got challenges and we've got issues in our society, in our lives, in our personal lives. We've got fears and anxieties. But when you see it the way God sees it, when you experience it through the eyes of the Lord, through the eyes of Christ, it's just different. And my prayer for me and you is to stop seeing things from a worldly point of view and see it through the grace and the love of Christ and the perspective of heaven and the compassion of heaven. And that's when you can, even when you're explaining truth to power, are you reaching out to somebody, are you working out issues, you can do it with grace, love, empathy, and compassion. I mean, you shrug off the labels of red and blue. Shrug off, shrug off the different issues and put on the cloak of Christ. That we are aliens and strangers in this world. We represent the kingdom of God. Something bigger than all that. And it allows us to have empathy and compassion and understanding that the world just can't have. Because we don't see things from a worldly point of view. It goes on and explains the reason why that is. The reason why our sight's been changed is that we have become a new creation. A new creation. Let's, get, let's read back, back in verse 17. It says, Therefore, anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old is gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. And we'll talk about that more next week, what that ministry is and what it means. But we're given the ability to do what the world can't do is to reconcile with people. Help people to reconcile with God, us to reconcile with God, to reconcile with family members and hurts and, and, and be the healer of community rather than the divider of community. Right? We have this amazing power. Why? Because we have become a new creation. That in Christ, through the Spirit, that when you receive the blood of Christ, you became a new creation. And the old is gone. The old left. And the new's here. And it's not just that you got baptized and received a new rule book. Because who could live up to that? You received the Spirit of God. And teaches us in Ephesians chapter 1 that the, the very spirit, the same, the same power that raised Christ from the dead lives in you and lives in me. That power that raised the, the dead transforms my life. Transforms my mind. Frees my mind from guilt, from pride, from anger, from lust. Heals my loneliness. Heals my hurt. That power that raised Christ from the dead 
Changes the way I see myself. Breaks family curses. Breaks family curses. Allows the, the weak to become strong. Allows the hard to become loving. Allows us to trust, not because people are perfect, because God has us. God will take care of us, even in the storm. You know, if you're making Christianity about what you can become and what you have to do, that's a hard road. Because you're trying to carry a weight that you'll never carry. It's not about being good enough. Let me say that again. It's not about being good enough. It's not about, you know, being disciplined and you're going to change your mind and you're going to make this happen. It's about surrendering and letting the Spirit of God transform you. He makes you. He makes me a new creation. We don't make ourselves that. This isn't bodybuilding. He makes you a new creation. I never forget, back when baseball was a thing, yeah, I know people, some people love baseball, but back when it was a, was a major thing, I never forget that we went through this thing in the 90s where, you, where guys would, you know, be kind of normal-sized baseball players. And then the next year as they come back and they had muscles like cartoon characters. And the heads got bigger and the baseball bat looking like a twig in their hands and knocking out home runs right and left. I never forget Barry Bonds was a great, great baseball player and he was kind of slim. And then one year he came out and he was all swole and his head was twice the size. And he's knocking home runs out like, you know, like it's nothing. And there's no amount of workout that would produce that. He had a little extra help, right? Steroids, HGH, all that kind of stuff that, that was going on then. It's probably still going on now. But there was a big explosion. No one was trying to hide it back then. Now, what's that have to do with God? Well, I'm glad you asked. I can't lift the burden of my life. I can't forgive the hurt that's been done to me. I can't stop from being bitter. I can't stop from being scared. I can't stop. I can't stop from being lonely. I can't stop the, from being anxious about the future. I can't, I can't turn off my sinful nature. I need some steroids. I need some help. I need the Holy Spirit power in me to make me what I can't be. This isn't something we do on our own. This is something we do through the Spirit's power. Through the Spirit's power transforming us in ways that we can't transform ourselves. We just have to get out the way and not put that burden of transformation on ourselves. But here's the thing about transformation. You know, if we make it about works, you know, what it's like say planting a seed in the ground. And then standing over that seed and saying, grow, grow, I told you to grow. That's the same. I mean, you can water it, you can do the right things, but you can't like make it grow. It's, it's got to, that, that's God that makes things grow, right? You just got to do your part. Okay, in the same way, we, we do our part and we pray and we read. We, 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 we give God our bed, we surrender our life, we, we make our, we repent of our sin. When we fall, we make every effort to please him. And yet, aside from that, God's got to make us grow. He has to renew our mind and transform us. He washes our sins away. He, he makes us more than who we are. You don't make yourself grow. But here's the other part of it. Growing is painful. Growing takes a whole lot of rain and a whole lot of sunshine, a whole lot of uncomfortable situations. And so I can't force myself to grow, but I can't resist the spirit. Because we want to grow, we want to change, but we don't want pain. We want to grow, but we don't want to be uncomfortable. We want to grow, but we don't we want to grow in our faith, but we don't want to be in situations that require faith. We want to grow in, 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 in our character, but we don't want to go through things that build character. And so part of being a new creation is he's the potter and we're the clay. And he's got to mold us and he's got to whatever. And you know, man, you ever had a massage? Man, having a great massage feels so good, but it can be painful and uncomfortable too as you work up the knots and the things going on. It's just, and you can't have the one without the other. 
God is molding us and he's working us and he's making a new creation. But we can't resist the spirit as it pulls and it pulls and it pushes us to do things that are flat uncomfortable. And part of surrender is surrendering to growth. You can't become courageous unless you're put in scary situations. You can't become faithful unless you're put in situations that you can't see how it ends. Man, you can't become strong in the Lord unless you're put in situations that are too big for you to carry. Man, you can't become compassionate and forgiving unless you're put in situations where you've been hurt. You can't have the spirit of Christ and the character of Christ unless you're persecuted, unless you go through hard times. To share in the glory of the Lord, you also have to share in the suffering of the Lord. And through it all, he'll make you a new creation and help you be heaven bound and change your character and change your mind and change your point of view and make you someone that can be a minister of reconciliation that changes this world. But I have to be submissive to the process of growth. That ain't easy. Because I want the glory and not the pain. Man, I, I want the changes and not the journey. I want the end result, but I want to skip steps. And I can't make myself grow, but I'm not going to grow if I resist the Spirit's process. If I run back to the world and my worldly behavior and my worldly point of view and my worldly actions every time I'm uncomfortable. What about you? Part of the heaven role, part of keeping the main thing the main thing is allowing our, our worldview to change. And allowing the spirit to transform us into a new creation. But I've got to teach myself not to resist the spirit but to trust the Spirit. And if I do, not only will I go to heaven, and I stay on the path to heaven, I will help many, many people find it awesome. How's that going for you? Are you letting the Spirit work in you during the scary, during the hard, during the challenging times in front of you right now? My prayer for you and for me is that we remind one another to stay on the road because God is making us something special and doing something great to powerful transformation. Let's trust God and allow him to change our mind, to change every bit of us through the power of his spirit. Amen. Amen. But that concludes the message this week. I got much else I could say, but we've run out of time a little while ago. Let's be people where the main thing's the main thing and we're heaven bound. Let's encourage one another to be heaven bound so that we can be tools for reconciliation in this lost world. And we'll talk about that next week. That'll be the fifth and final installment of the series. And I hope the series will be good to you. At this time, we'll include the message and we're going to pray for communion in just a second. And we're going to take that together as a body. But before we do, a couple of announcements. This, this uh, uh, past Sunday was congregational. This past Wednesday, I'm sorry, was congregational. This next one is going to be a small group. So this next midweek will be in small groups. And we do have some small groups today. So if you, if you, if you have one, uh, make sure you plan on that. If you, if you want to know more about the small groups, please call us, text us, email us, and we'll let you know more about it. It's great to have everybody here to worship. Look, if you had a great time worshiping, tell a friend. You know, get your friends and family involved, too. And let's worship together, okay? To God be the glory. I'll see you soon. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, God, thank you for your spirit and your power and your grace. Thank you for your healing. Thank you for the way that through your power we can become new creations. Heavenly Father, we pray special prayers for those who are sick right now. We pray for Walter Martin Ori for all they go through for our daughter Jacqueline for what she's going through right now to God and her health. I pray for my own health to God that you that you uh, continue to work to improve that situation to God. I pray for Ms. Boreen to watch over her, 
the guy for anyone right now, the guy, all, all the first responders, all our teachers, all our educators, everyone having to go out in the workforce right now, that you watch over them in a powerful way. God, we thank you for your grace. We thank you for your son dying for us on the cross. That we take this bread that represents the body that was slain and drink this fruit of the vine that represents the blood that was shed. I pray that we remember you and remember to trust you. We pray all this in your name through your son, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.